Thank you. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining the session, How to Captivate and Persuade Your Audience, Tools and Techniques by Nathan Gold. My name is Izumi Yamamoto, Area D1 Director. This is one of the sessions from District 101 program called Great Events. It will offer many learning opportunities throughout the year, so please check out the official website on District 101, time to time. With that, let me introduce the Toastmaster of the day, Satish Shenoy. He has been Toastmaster since 2012, and as everybody knows, he's a DTM. Please welcome Satish. Thank you. Thank you, Izumi. I am delighted to be here to um, as a host for really hosting a special speaker, as a great friend, Nathan Gold. I've known Nathan for a few years. He's based in our Bay Area. He's from here. And he travels the world coaching people on how to prepare for high stakes speaking opportunities and how to harness the anxiety that you feel when, you, when you're speaking you know, early in your speaking career. He does this through countless keynotes. He's, he's actually helped a lot of my colleagues at work. Uh, this is one way I've, I found out about Nathan. And, um, you know, ever since then, I've been attracted to all of his great work. He's an, uh, he's an amazing speaker. He actually coaches people both uh, online and in person. He helped innumerable number of uh, salespeople throughout his career. He, he actually was one of those people early, not early on in his career and then went on to really help those people be successful. In fact, some of the companies that he has worked for, including mine, have uh, really hailed him as one of the reasons why salespeople and uh, even entrepreneurs were successful. Nathan has uh, personally delivered a lot of uh, presentations and countless hours of coaching. He's an amazing coach. I've, I've even had him as a, a coach. The Wall Street Journal called him an elevator pitch expert. And I can tell you from personal experience that he is an amazing uh, elevator pitch coach. He's, uh, he's part of UC Berkeley. He's done some work there. He's also part of uh, Hong Kong ba Baptist University, a guest lecturer at Wharton Entrepreneurship uh, Institute and the Founder School. I mean, he we can't go on and on. We, we just have much to cover. So I'm going to spare no uh, time more in welcoming Nathan Gold. Over to you, Nathan. Thank you so much, Satish, and Toastmasters around the world that are watching now. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you right now. So I recommend that all of you take your screens right now and go into speaker view because I am going to do something a little bit different with you here today. So uh, to begin with, uh, let me just make sure all the tech on this side is working. Let me be bring up my slides for you. And uh, this is how we're going to present to you today. So I have some good news for you and maybe some bad news for you. And that is there's nothing really new here. I'm going to spend less than 40 minutes of your time and not really tell you anything new. But what I am going to do is give you friendly reminders, things that either you've heard of that you're not using or things that you heard of a long time ago and now you realize you can use them today. So once again, I would just wanna take a moment and say thank you so much to the entire Toastmasters organization. Whoops, sorry about that. The entire Toastmasters organization for giving me the opportunity to present to presenters. And I know that all of you are presenters and speakers. This has gotta be one of the most difficult talks as a speaker, coach, that I could ever possibly give. And that's why I'm not really going to give you a speech today. But I do want to let you know that I am so grateful that since forever, that Toastmasters has been turning out some of the most incredible examples of what it's like to deliver passionate, emotional, and truly connecting presentations such as the famous Mohammed Katani. With that in mind, would all of you mind taking out your smartphones or your tablet right now and scan the QR code that you see on the screen? In fact, whoops, let me make it a little bit bigger for you there. 
scan the QR code you see on the screen right now. And this is the way I'd like to offer you the opportunity to ask me questions anytime throughout my talk talk part. We do have the end carved out for questions, but I would love it if you just go ahead and ask questions through this medium. It's simple, there's no application to download. If one of you in the field right now could just ask me any questions so I can see something pop up on the screen, that would let you know that it's all working. It doesn't matter what the question really is. Just to be sure that it's working. You could also go to slido.com and just put in D101TI. Okay, all right. So let's move on and I will continue so that we can get into some interactions here. For example, if you would look at your smartphone again right now, automatically your screen should have been refreshed. Could you all just put in the city where you are right now, please? I'd love to know where each of you are. Thank you. Dublin, Boston, not your name, silly. Where, where are you, what city are you in? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Good. I like to use an organic word cloud like this instead of having everybody put where they're at in the chat window and then I have to go over to the chat window and figure all that kind of good stuff out. So while only five or so of you have replied to this already and I see some of you putting it into the chat window, it's totally okay. I just wanted to give you a quick illustration of another way that you might be able to interact with your audience. Uh, which might not be the traditional way that you see people doing it today. So how do you get people to accept your ideas? Well, this is the basic question I'm faced with every single day. And once you get them accepting your ideas, then it makes it much easier for them to take the action that you want them to take. So let's get back to basics because there are three things I wanna cover before I get into some real tools. The first is, when I was 17 years old, I read this book. My dad handed it to me. He said, here, read this book. It'll make you a better person. And so I did, because what I learned were the six ways to get people to like you. And I'm going to tell you, they work. If you haven't looked at this, and I'm pretty sure probably 86% of you have already got these memorized, these work. From there, uh, about seven years later, this book came out called Influence. And if you want to learn how to be more persuasive, this to me is the Bible. When I read this book, it changed my entire outlook on what it meant to present, to give training classes, to give demos, to give keynotes, and to help others. Because we're not normally there to just give information. Uh, yes, some, some presentations are informational transfer, but what most of the time we're there to do is persuade. And if you're trying to get people to take action, you can't just throw a bunch of information on the table and say, hey, good luck with it all. You need to persuade to take action. And this is the Bible on, on persuasion. So if you haven't already looked at that, not only does Caldini have the six uh, principles for, for persuasion, but he's got a new book out called Persuasion, which covers the seventh one. Now, I'm not really here to talk about those books more than just remind you that those are my Bibles. That's where I'm coming from. As a consultant for 13 years, before that, I just thought I'd give you a quick rundown. I do have a degree in computer science from Stony Brook on Long Island, and my entire career, with the exception of one year, was spent side by side with salespeople. I would travel all over the world and I would be the person that would demo the product or the service that I was working with. And it was all tech companies, all pretty much software, hardware companies that I worked for. SanDisk, Extensity, Symbol Technologies. After I got laid off the third time, I was 50 years old and I decided, you know what? That's it. No one is ever going to have that power over me again. And so what do you do when you don't wanna get retired? you start your own business. And that's exactly what I did. I thought, okay, I'm just going to go coach other people on how to be better people at demoing products. So I wrote a book, failed, meaning a year after a year, I couldn't compete with the big people out there already doing it. So a year into it, I met my first entrepreneur and that changed everything. And now I help entrepreneurs raise money, get really important customer meetings going. And now it's all over the map after 13 years working with corporations and like uh, Satish mentioned a moment ago. But throughout my career, there was a word that drove me crazy, and that was sales, selling. You know, to me, you have to be the right kind of person 
to be in that role. But we are all, every single one of you on this line are in the persuasion business. And you can all be better at persuading, including me. In fact, persuasion, I'm here to suggest to you, is a lifelong skill. You can learn about persuasion, something new every single day. And the key to being persuasive from my experience, and this is just Nathan Gold talking, is trust. If you can build trust with your audience and keep building it and never break that trust, whether it's a talk like I'm giving you right now, or whether it's a 10 year relationship, trust to me is at the center of being persuasive. Now we could argue this all day long, but there's no time for you to argue with me. And since the floor is mine, I'm just gonna take you through now what trust is not, which is I am not here to give you a new methodology about how to build trust with your audiences. That is not my gig. I'm not a psychologist, but what I am is a handyman. So today, what I'm going to give you is a toolbox, okay? The toolbox is going to have a bunch of tools in it. They're all proven. I didn't make them up. I've been using them for a long time and they work. Now, some of them you've already heard of, like the wrench or the hammer. Some of them you might go, wow, I just, I didn't realize about that one. So what we're going to do now is run you through the top 10 tools that I use to be persuasive, especially in my own consulting practice, because I am a company of one. And when I first started, my fees were in the double digits and now my, my fees are in the low four digits per hour. And you got to be pretty persuasive if you couldn't get people to pay you your hourly fee, the more and more value that you offer. So each of the tools that I'm going to share with you now are marked with a little yellow hat in the top left corner so you can spot them very quickly. I'm a big believer in making signposts throughout your presentation, which might be one of the core tenets of your particular Toastmasters. I don't know. Anyway, so let's start at the beginning. The tool, the first tool is the beginning, but not the beginning as you think of it. I read this book when my boss first gave me my first training class and he said, here, read this book and it'll help you be a better presenter. Now, don't go rush off to buy the book because it doesn't even have a barcode, it's out of print and it's old. But what I wanna do share with you right now is the one chapter in that book that completely changed my life, my life literally that night because I've used this in every single presentation, every training class, every keynote. I use it, I used it on you here today and I'll prove it to you right now. It's called the six signals that every audience needs to hear from you as a presenter. What's the first signal that most people are wondering when they come to a presentation on a Saturday afternoon, two o'clock Pacific time? Oh my God, I'd much rather be doing something else. What's on your mind? Well, is it gonna be a waste of my time? Now, I hope that you did not feel this at all not only based on the way this started with Izumi and Satish, which is the normal start on time, rock, 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 next minute, next minute, all dialed in. And then when I took over, I hope that you all felt that I would not waste your time. And we can talk about that during Q&A. But the most important thing that you need to communicate to your audiences is that you will not waste their time. And this can be done probably three or four or five ways without literally saying, okay, I'm not, I promise you I won't waste your time. Although I do like to actually say that to people sometimes. So hopefully you found that were two or three different ways that you knew this wasn't going to be a waste of your time. On top of that, I know I'm pre pressing on time, but this is, it's just so important, especially in today when we're having Zoom after Zoom after Zoom after Zoom after Zoom. Time is so precious. So make sure that when you think you have a 30 minute meeting with somebody up front, just say, hey, thank you for your time, Satish. I see we, we got about 22 minutes on the clock. Do we still have until 2.30? Until and then he'll say, yes, we do. And then great, now Satish knows this guy's gonna be finished on time. He knows that we don't have to blah, blah, blah. And, or he'll say, Nathan, thanks for asking. You know what, I have to get to another meeting. Could you just give me five more minutes back? And I say, absolutely, I'll give you 10. And now you just save the day and now they're, it's, it's like a virtual hug for your audience. So cover the time thing and you will see your audiences almost go, oh, finally, somebody's not going to waste my time. And they let me know that right up front. Number two is you need to let your audience know that you know who they are. Now, this is very specific to the role of the person in the presentation. So I'll just leave this one out on the table. 
Number three is as a presenter, you really need to be well organized. If you show up on camera or in a room and you pull out a bag full of cords that are all messed up, it's not a good start, folks. So if you're not organized, I don't care, but at least fake it when you're in public. Get, it, get something behind you that doesn't show what's behind you if you have to. Number four, you know, you, I know my subject. Now, in, in a perfect world, Satish could go with me everywhere, right? And when I have to speak, Satish would introduce me, but that's not generally the case. The, generally, the case is you need to introduce yourself. And when you introduce yourself, I'm not talking about reading your CV or your resume to your audience. I'm talking about a humble brag. A humble brag is something that when you say it with one gentle sentence, people go, whoa, okay, I guess I could trust that person a little bit longer. So that humble brag is something like, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For the past 13 years, I have traveled around the world doing blah, 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 blah. So 13 years is probably enough to at least believe this guy knows what he's talking about. I can trust him a little bit longer. And if you can't talk about yourself in one sentence, one sentence as part of a story that people say, whoa, I keep talking. I can trust you a little longer. Hit that QR code you see on the screen right now, and you will be able to go ahead and track into what Peggy Klaus calls the take 12 questions. I didn't make this stuff up, but when I found this book years and years ago, I went to the take 12 questions myself, and I can tell you, it changed my life. It changed how I was able to talk about myself because you want to do it with humility. You don't want to go, I did this, and I did that, and I did that. And like, no, that's not, that's bragging. It's a humble brag. Okay. Uh, this is not to teach you how to humbly brag. I'd be happy to follow up with any of you after that. That would be happy to do that pro bono. Don't worry. You can always follow up with me after. Signal number five is a magic one. Oh, first, by the way, these four signals, they all happen in like the first minute. Like really quickly. You don't make a big deal. It just happens. Now, signal number five is you talk about a lot, you say a lot, you give all this great stuff out, and now you really want everyone's attention. These magic words that you see on the screen right now will always draw everyone's attention back to you, and they will have a blank paper waiting in their brains. Now, you can only do this one time per presentation. <laughs> if you try to do this more than once, people will catch you and they'll say, well, let's see now, was that the most or is this the most or which was the most? And then number six, please, I know you're all taught to do this. Let people know you're done. Finish. Thank you. Whatever you do to wrap it up. But believe me, in the startup world, I got to tell you, people just forget to finish. Yeah, we're raising a seed round. We'd be happy for you to join us. Oh, oh, we're done, by the way. Uh, you got any questions? <laughs> it's like, really? You just couldn't say thank you? I'd be delighted to take your questions now. All right. So those are the six signals. I'm moving on, and I know I'm going fast, but this stuff is not that hard, folks. Speaking of not that hard, I must tell you that one of the places that I want to help you with to be more persuasive, be able to captivate your audiences more, is using your camera. Your camera is so important, but we're not treating the camera with respect. It's almost like you have to learn how to be on television. It takes some practice. But the first thing, you need to make sure you have good sound quality. Because if you have crappy sound quality, everything else doesn't matter. You can have 4K resolution, but if you have crappy sound quality, nobody's going to be able to hear what you're saying. So make sure that you know that your voice, as you all know, your voice is one of those magic pieces of the puzzle that that's how you transfer your enthusiasm, your passion, your energy, your electricity to the ears of your listeners, right? So when you do it over microphones, you can really have some fun, but you need a good microphone because when you have a good microphone, you can sound like you're on a freaking radio and you're in your bedroom like me, but you need a good microphone. Any of the microphones you see on the screen right now, any of them that cost over a hundred US dollars, are probably going to give you radio quality. The one I'm using is the most one on the left here made by uh, Yeti Blue. I really want to get one of those ones in the middle. They're called Neat. They're really cool, but I don't want to spend the money. And I've got, I love my Yeti, so I'm just going to keep it. But any of these high-end microphones, 
They're not that much money, but they make you sound really good. Speaking of sounding good, remember in, in, in rooms, we tend to get excited. We show our passion with our voices. We project into the back of the rooms. If you do that online, you may blow people's ears out. So you want to be very careful. If you have a good microphone, a high-end microphone like I'm using right now, if I use the normal voice I would use in a room right now, you would all be turning the volume so far down, you wouldn't be able to even make out what I was saying. I hope I'm not too hot on your microphone, on your, your speakers right now. I, I do tend to get a little too excited sometimes. Next, eye contact. <clears throat> this is where most people are completely, completely blowing it. And that is they're looking in the wrong place. They're looking in the wrong place. So the camera's in the wrong place. So the first thing you need to do is put the camera in a place where when you look, you can look into the camera. Kind of like this dude is looking at you right now. And like I've been looking at you. You need to move your cameras up. If you have an external camera, it's easier to move your camera up. I realize that. But if you have a laptop and your camera's down at the, at the hinge, you might have to prop it up on some books or get a stand that lets you roll it up and you have to just move it up so that you're kind of looking straight at it or just a little bit up. And if you stand, then that's the same thing. You want to make sure the camera is looking straight at you. We're looking up your noses, folks. I'm not you, of course, but in some cases, we're looking up your noses. We're looking at the ceiling fans. We're looking at lights coming down on your head like you're an angel. I know you're all angels, but really, we don't need to be looking at your ceilings. So if you have an external camera, you can stick it in front of your screen like you see here, which allows you to put your content behind the camera. And then you basically just look straight into the camera lens like I'm doing with you right now. And you can use your peripheral vision to see what's behind it. Although in my office, I do have two monitors here. I'll show you what it looks like in just a moment. So the key here is very simple. And it just simply takes practice. You need to literally love your camera. When you love your camera, your audiences will love you more because they will all think you are looking straight at them in their bedrooms, in their offices, wherever they are in the world, or maybe even in their car. Speaking of cars, when I travel, I carry one of these selfie sticks and I have one in my car, every car, I carry one in my bag because if you have to pull over and do a video call, you just get one of these little selfie sticks that has a, a tripod at the bottom, stick, it, stick your smartphone in there, dial into your Zoom call, Teams call, and you're up and running. Now, you won't be able to do some of the fancy things that maybe I'm doing with you right now, but you can at least get a pretty good resolution of you into that Zoom call. Lighting. If you're going to be persuasive online and captivate your audiences, you can't look like this. <laughs> If you're not lit up, how can we see you? So if you're too lit up, how can we see you? So be careful of how much light is behind you and also be careful of how much sunlight is on you. Too much sunlight makes us all look terrible. Most cameras can't handle too much of that light. When you have a higher end camera, it can. The ideal world for you as a presenter is if you always wanna come across with the same look and feel you want to have artificial lighting that you can control. In my office here, I have blackout curtains on my left. I have two lights on the sides here, and I'll show you in a moment exactly how it works. You don't need to spend money on these really expensive lamps that that guy's using. He's a professional gamer. These bulbs are what I'm using here in my office. They're called Casa Smart Bulbs. You can get them at Best Buy, just about anywhere, online, $22 a piece. You can then control exactly the brightness that you want and the whiteness and even the color. So no matter who you are, where you are, you can dial it in exactly the way you want it. And they're not that expensive. And the good news is you don't need a hub. I don't need new hubs in my house. So you just screw these things into, I bought these things for 10 bucks at the hardware store. I have one hanging on each of my bookshelves here. Each of the smart bulbs are plugged in and then I use a smartphone application to control the bulbs. There's no, there's no other hub. So this is what my office looks like. I have my Yeti in my, in my front. I usually set my keyboard off to the side, two screens and three lights. The third light is because I often forget to shut it off because <laughs> I have my two lights on only when I'm presenting. If I'm not presenting, I shut off my Casa bulbs. Now there's a secret here. Does anybody see the secret in this picture? There's a very important component to being able to present sitting or standing on a moment's notice. You see where my camera is? 
right in the middle of the screen. That's because, and oh, I forgot to mention, you can scan this QR code that'll take you to a page on my website that talks about literally everything I have in my office, if you're curious. But the piece I wanted to draw your attention to, and by the way, I don't get any affiliate pay by, by when you buy those products. I should, but I don't. There's, a, there's this beautiful, inexpensive, articulating uh, arm that lets you hook your camera on literally anywhere you want and you can raise it up and you can put it down and you can move it around and place it right in front of things. I used to have a tripod in front of my screens, but I got tired of moving the tripod out of the way. So this, yes, it does block a little bit of my screen, but it lets me put it literally anywhere I want. Next up is that in this busy, busy world we're in, pandemic or not, whenever we have to present, we have to realize that everyone listening is preoccupied with something else. They just are. And there's nothing you can do about it except break through that preoccupation. So if you want to captivate your audiences and get them to take action and really pay closer attention to the things that you're talking about, no matter what the situation is, I want to share with you a secret that I learned I even forget the year. It was, I was so, I was in my late teens and my dad was about to throw this book in the garbage. And I grabbed the book and I said, no, dad, I love magic. I'm, can I have it? And then about five years later, I took it out of my box and I realized this has nothing to do with magic. But when I opened it up and I read it, I realized, oh my God, I have just discovered the secret to breaking through the preoccupation that every audience, everyone in the world has pretty much all day, every day. And this author from his experience in public relations literally gave me the secret. And so I wanna share it with you. And the good news here is you already know. But once you know some of these kind of secrets or a little bit of the science behind why people do things, then you can use them with more purpose and hopefully only for good. So Roy Gorn calls it the fatal four emotional appeals. Why does he call it the fatal four? Well, because you cannot defend against their use. None of us can really defend against the use of these appeals. When you try to make an emotional appeal to someone and you make it about money, <laughs> they're listening. Making money, losing money, spending money, gambling money, anything to related to money, you get our attention. You break through what, 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 what'd you say? You'll see how this works in just a moment. The second one is recognition. When you give recognition, when you know you're getting recognition, when it's a surprise that you got recognition, when you, recognition, if you're going to be recognized, as you will keep talking. I'm keep talking. I'm waiting. Earlier today, I was on checking my tech with Satish. Satish, I'm going to share this quick story because there's time. And uh, he said, just a minute, I want to share this really fun story about you. I won't give the details. Hang on, hang on. And I'm sitting there going, he said, oh, you're really going to love this because your name was mentioned. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm sitting there going, normally I would go, oh, you know, I'll go back to do an email. I'm just sitting there on pins and needles waiting for him to give me the recognition that he was going to dig out. And when he finally gave it to me, I was like, oh, thank you. So it works on me too. It works on all of us. Number three is self-preservation. Anything to do with Safety, security, self-preservation, you can break through anybody's preoccupation. And this is not just with your physical safety and your family safety, but it's your data safety and the safety and security of your belongings and your, your people and all of that kind of stuff. And then number four is called future promise. There's actually three parts to this. Future promise, romance, and sex. He calls them all kind of the same thing. Like if you see a beautiful advertisement of a beautiful woman or a beautiful man, it, it kind of breaks. Oh, I'll take a look at that for a moment. Right? It breaks through whatever we're preoccupied with. But I like to call it future promise because as a presenter, you can promise things to your audience about their futures and be tapping into the emotional appeal of nothing different than going on a vacation to a place you've never been before. Why do you go? Because of the future promise, you're going to have a good time. You don't go on a vacation to a place you've never been hoping to have a bad time. So we can use money, recognition, self-preservation, and future promise more 
specifically when you're trying to break through that preoccupation that you know we all have even more today than ever before. Now, the beauty behind this is you can use one, two, or all of them. Now, the fifth one that people have been telling me emotional appeal that I, I'm, I'm not here to argue about is spiritual. Anything spiritual, that would break through preoccupation for many people if they're spiritual. Not here to talk about that. Now, eight years ago, a gentleman jumped up on stage at the Coffin Foundation in, San, in, in Kansas City and said, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm thrilled to be here to share with you the machines that we build that turn water into money. 300 of us, including Guy Kawasaki, was in the room. We all looked up. And he puts this on the screen. He says, we build canal turbines. You throw these things into a rushing waterway. You tie it off to the side. You plug it in. As soon as those flappers start spinning, you are, you are generating free electricity. So does he build a machine that turns water into money? Half my audience usually says yes. Half says no. And some people don't know what. The point I'm making here is that most people, when they start a presentation, of course, no Toastmaster would do this. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We build canal turbines. Want to know more? No, I don't want to know more because I don't need a canal turbine. But what I'm just getting across here to you is that that person on stage used a figure of speech to get our attention, to break through, to get us to look up. Not only did he do that, but he used one of the four emotional appeals. Money, right? Money. Boom. We're all interested. We want to know. So when you can put something together like that, where you use a good simile, analogy, or a metaphor, that might be the only thing people remember from your presentation, believe it or not. In persuasion, if people walk away from a half an hour of you talking and all they remember is, are you the guy that builds machines that turns water into money? If that's all they remember, I would feel on top of the world. And that's the power of metaphors and similes and analogies. And the book I'm sharing with you on the screen right now, I'll make it just a little bit larger so you can get to the author's name, is the best book for getting your part, your creative brain to think, hmm, I got to use one of these things in my business or in my speaking gig. And you just go through the book. There's hundreds of examples in that book of how to come up with these things. All right, we're almost done. And then we're going to go into Q&A. But I want to bump the trust level up even higher. Number eight, we live in a pretty complex world. We always have. And it's getting more and more and more complex. It's just when you live and how you define complexity. But when it comes to presenting, if you're presenting and you are trying to com communicate a complex issue or topic, it's hard work, isn't it? It's really hard work. So I'm here to suggest to you that if you can bring clarity to complexity as a presenter, as a keynoter, as a coach, you'll change the world. For example, not these kind of pictures, but when you use pictures like this, it brings sense to data, doesn't it? Of course, we all use graphs and here, here's where our sales are going. I'm not talking about these kind of pictures. I'm talking about these kind of pictures. This picture you're looking at, and if you've never seen it before, is the first known map of the world. It's actually called a TO map, TO map. You can look it up if you want. It's called an OT map, TO map. Basically, it's a circle with a T in the middle. Jerusalem, the center of the world, is right there in the middle. You got the Mediterranean Sea, you got Africa, Europe, Asia. And now, with this simple little picture, everyone in the world could easily kind of figure out where they are compared to where they're going and where they've been without all the detail that we have in a map today. I know this might sound a little ridiculous, but what I'm here to suggest to you is that perhaps one of the missing elements in being a really persuasive presenter is taking whatever it is you're trying to communicate to your audience and turning it into a picture. I'm not talking about being an artist because I'm not an artist. I'm talking about using exactly what you see on the screen right now. Squares, circles, ellipses, arrows, stick figures. Here's a quick example. Dan Rome, an author that I'll share a book, share the, the books he has written in just a moment. 
in the early days of his consulting, he was invited to present at the McKinsey, the top consulting firm in the world. And he de declined. He says, I'm not going to go compete with the big boys and girls. So he, he got a call the night before and he said, we want you to come in. He says, all right, I'll come in. So he was playing with his daughter that night and they were playing with Legos. And this was in the early days of the, of the portals when nobody knew what the hell a portal was, how they connected, what they, nobody knew. So Dan walks in with some Lego blocks. He's like the fourth or fifth presenter. He puts the Lego blocks on the table. He says, there's five portals and here's how they fit together. Boom, 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 boom. And then when they talk together and he just talked through it and about 10 minutes into the talk, they stopped him and they said, you know, you're the first person the very first person who's brought clarity to a very complex subject with something as simple as Lego blocks. So I cannot, I cannot tell you how sometimes something as simple as a stick figure can bring clarity and make you more memorable than the people before you or after you, especially when you're trying to be persuasive. So Dan Rome, check out some of his books. He's amazing. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Simon Sinek. And all of you probably know Simon Sinek. You've seen his talks. I see you're shaking your heads. Yes, 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 yes. So I'm not here to talk about the golden circle, but what I am here to talk about is that two things about the golden circle. One, if I didn't draw this on the screen or have this on the screen right now, I bet you most of you could draw it, right? Didn't I, doesn't that prove Dan Rome's point that a simple picture can sometimes bring tremendous clarity to a very complex topic like how to connect with your audience on an emotional level. Start with why. What a concept. So simple. This is not new stuff, folks. This is just a new way of looking at it and say, oh, look at that picture. It makes so much freaking sense. Of course. And that's what you can do with your pictures. So if you need help with Simon Sinek stuff, if you haven't already seen his book called Start With Why, um, um, I would actually suggest skip that book. Just go to the Find Your Why. It's much better. <laughs> All right, we're at number ten. And this is almost my favorite one, but I actually don't know which of which of the ten are my favorite. Now I know I've already given you nine nine tools. You can't use them all at the same time. Obviously, there's no best one. You don't have to use any of them, but hopefully. There was at least one so far that you say, oh, maybe I could try doing that. Oh, that was interesting. So what I want to do here is actually give you a separate little toolbox because there's so many little things I want to share with you and I don't have a lot of time to share them. So I've just picked kind of a bunch of, a bunch of cool little fun tools. So, and it all relates to the big excuse that I hear from most people in the online world. Oh my God, how do you talk to the camera? How do you interact with an audience when you can't see them? Or you got to look over here and say, hey, Satish, Cynthia, how you doing over there? Doing well? Yeah, look at that beautiful smile. But am I looking at you right now? No, of course not. So let's talk about audience interaction, right? You get all online like this. The minute you get over 15 or 16 people, the audience interaction gets a lot more complex, obviously. All right, so we'll, you know, there's really two games here. There's like the one to a manageable number, and then there's one to the many like we have right now, 24 people. I can't necessarily get you all on the same screen unless I have a big screen. But the point I want to make is we all need to stop making excuses. Right, you can't walk over to somebody and say, how are you doing today? I, I get that. You can't have somebody come into the room early and you walk over and say, hey, thanks for showing up early. What'd you come here to, what's your goal of this top? Blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, now you have all sorts of, you can do that online too. I want to compliment the Toastmasters organization because when I first went through my talk to verify that I wouldn't insult any of you with the things I was going to share with you, with not one, but three Toastmasters people, I realized most of you already do what I was about to say, which is you put something next to your name in these Zoom windows so that people know who the, who the heck you are. I mean, Kim, it's nice to know Kim has a nice first and last name. That first and last name is this, you know, the uh, first name. But I know what George does, don't you? Don't you all know what George does now? So I know that you do this in your Toastmasters meetings for where you are, and, and I, I totally respect that. And I think it's a great use of renaming yourself in these windows. Now, polling is something that is built into just about every one of the video products that are out there. So please use the polling if you can. It's not that hard, but the chat window, the chat window can become your friend. If you make everyone publicly and privately able to chat with one another, 
as a presenter, I might have 35 people on the line, right? And I say, okay, would there be anyone who wants to ask some questions now? What happens? Nobody asks any questions because nobody wants to talk. So I don't do that. I say, could you just go into the chat window and pop your name in there? And I'll just take your names as, don't, don't put the question, just pop your name in there. That's pretty easy. So Becky puts her name in there. I say, okay, Becky, let's start with you. Boom, Becky comes off of mute. She talks to me. I talk to the world. Everything's fine. Thank you, Becky. Off we go. Next up, Satish. Satish, what's your question? Right? So don't make people type those long things into the chat window. Just put their names in there. When I'm coaching and I have 12 people online and, and I don't want to pick them and, they, and I need volunteers, I say, okay, put your names in the chat window. I'm going to call you on you by the names in the chat window. If you haven't put your name in there, then it's a voluntold. Get in there. <laughs> Interacting with your audience as I did earlier with you for questions using Slido is just one tool. There are others out there. Word clouds, all can be done with things like that. Kahoot is another tool out there that you can, oh, you can gamify or funify some of the boring stuff that we have to talk about just using Kahoot. It's a, there, there's tools like it, but this is one to check out. Timers. Make the timers the bad people, the bad guys in your presentations. If you're going to give people a 10-minute break, put a timer up and say, I'm going to put a 10-minute timer up. When that timer is done and you hear that bell ring, I'm going to start. And then you don't have to come back and say, okay, everybody, come on, come on back, everybody, come on back, everybody, come on back. Just make the timer the bad guy, especially for exercises. Almost done. When you share your screens. I don't know if this is really that visible. Let me go a little larger to make it easier for you to see it. When you share screens, make sure you share the screen you want people to see when you're ready to start talking. Don't share your screen and then say, oh, wait a minute, I have to go into presentation mode. Uh, wait, wait, do you, see my, do you see my notes? And that's not being a professional. Make sure you have what you need and then just share that. Next, stop share. Like when you are done with your slides, stop sharing and go back to full screen so that you can command their attention instead of having to be next to your slide in a little postage stamp. I know I'm using a little bit of a different technique here with you right now. I'm just pressing buttons on my little control panel down below, but you can stop screen just as easy as you start screen. And lastly, your camera. If you take nothing else away from this presentation, except the fact that the only way you're your audience will know that they can trust you is you have to look into the camera. Love your camera. It will become a habit after a while and you'll get used to it, especially when you put your, your terminals and your screens behind the camera. So to conclude, I hope that you realize that there are many ways you can build trust. I've just given you 10 ways that you can add to the tools that you already do. Ironically, you are in the middle of that word, the more you build trust with your audience, the easier it will be to persuade them and the easier it will be for them to accept your ideas, whether they want to take action on them, that's up to you and how you ask them to take that next step. So remembering you are always at the center of every presentation that you make, every persuasion pitch you give. I hope that today I've given you a few things to, to use and take away. Speaking of takeaway, I have 25 seconds to give you a gift, which is a copy of my book. If you scan the QR code that you see on the screen right now, it will take you to my electronic business card, which we all need, by the way, in uh, the, the virtual world. And that's a free little application. Oh, let me get out of the way there. And uh, I am a big fan of LinkedIn, by the way. So if you want to link in with me. I am a big pay it forward person. I'll be happy to share my LinkedIn network and connect you with anybody in my network. So with that, you know, you actually have 59 seconds to finish late. So it does say 40, 40 minutes on my clock. I see we have a couple of questions that came in while we were going through the presentation. Let me go back to full screen give this back to Satish. And once again, just thank you all so much for giving me the opportunity to present to you here today, especially on a Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Very nice, very nicely done. I thought that was a phenomenal presentation. I've seen you speak on other topics. Uh, this was a topic I had not sp seen you before uh, speak on. So this was uh, amazing. I, I thought it was, uh, it was really well done. And I hope there are nuggets that people will take, especially as Toastmasters. Uh, you're always wanting to learn and grow.
And that's why this exists and how to use those skills in the real world. I think you've given us uh, a number of those uh, nuggets today. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So I'd like to encourage people. I, I see some, as you said, I see some questions on in in uh, Slido. So yep. if there are people wanting to ask questions, sure. It, oh, somebody is asking if you can show the slide again with all ten tools listed. Maybe you can do that while we take I some questions. I didn't show all ten tools listed on the same slide. Harry, I don't know where you were, which presentation, you were, which slide you were looking at, but maybe it is. Um, what I will do, though, Satish, is uh, when this is all over, I will create a PDF file of my slides and give them to whomever you want me to, so they can include sure. it with the with that. But I don't. That's... I didn't have a summary slide. Thank you for pointing out the error of my ways. I do need to add a summary slide of mm, all ten at once. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Maybe we we'll create a one. Yeah, Sorry. Go ahead. Maybe we can create one and and send yeah. it as part of the. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for question number one. What software are you using to place the slide in your virtual background? Uh, it's called OBS Studio. OBS, OBS Studio. Studio. I'll just put it in the chat. OBS uh, Studio. It's a free open source software that you can use to control the camera feed and what people see. I never shared my screen with you today. Uh, I don't even use the share button anymore. I just share my camera and I control the actual scenes either using my mouse or in my case, I bought a box and I program the scene. I just I, I drop the scene under a button and that way I can just say, okay, let me go full screen with my slides so that you can see them for a moment. And then I just press a button so I don't even have to look around for what I'm doing. OBS software, a studio. There's other products out there like it uh, yeah. Most of them cost money. Uh, there is a new version of OBS Studio sort of coming out from a from the com company that makes uh, Evernote. It's called mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just going to post it here. This yeah. is the other option for most people. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, OBS is more open source, while mm -hmm seems to be a little more packaged, if you will. Yeah. So if um, if people are technophobics, you can yeah. uh, potentially yeah. use, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I just put that link in there, so thanks. But it sure does make it interesting from the standpoint that no two people think similarly as to how they move themselves around on screen or what backgrounds they use. And I am using a green screen behind me and uh, that allows him you know, pretty much to do just about anything. Like when I roll myself around on the screen, the only reason I can do that seamlessly is because of the green screen that's behind me. Uh, okay, something that was common throughout your presentation was you were telling stories. How does storytelling fit into the importance of all we do as speakers? Uh, I actually would, if I was in person with you, I would say, what do you think? <laughs> I, I feel that stories come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Most people think you have to start your story at the beginning and then tell them the middle and then tell them the end. I didn't do that with you today. If you go back and listen to what I did with you here today, I only told you the part of the story that was important to make my point. I didn't have time to waste. Now I'm not saying you waste time with stories, but we all know we waste time with too many details. I have a sister that tells so many details that have absolutely nothing to do with the story and nothing to do with the point she's trying to make. It's like after 15 minutes, I have to often stop her and say, hey, could you get back to the point of the story? And she goes, oh yeah, of course, of course. And that's sometimes what we do as storytellers. We just, we're having such a good time telling this story because you have the floor and nobody's interrupting you and you're just going to go on and you feel so good, you start improvising. And when I coach TED and TEDx presenters, that's the death of a TED talk. Start improvising, it's over. <laughs> when you learn a talk, not memorize, well, maybe you memorize it, but when you learn a six-minute talk or a 12-minute talk and you start improvising, when you have to present against a clock, 
you can only tell the parts of the story that you can tell at that time to make your point. And it's okay to leave people curious. What do you think movie trailers do? They don't tell you the whole story. They tell you just enough so you want to go to the movie or so that you don't. I hope I've answered that question, but I think that they're very important. I don't know how many stories I told, but I told probably at least 10. And we talked for, I talked for 40 minutes at a pretty rapid rate. <laughs> Okay, so that's all the questions that have come in with Slido, and that's okay. We can move back to any other questions. You can come off of mute. There's only 13 people. Oh, no, I see 24 people. There were 13 in the chat. We can look in the chat, Satish. I don't normally look in the chat until about right now. So please, I'd be happy to either take any other questions. So there is a question comments. from Harry. He says, sure. um, it's good to have eye contact, but we usually look at the video screen. I bet he's talking about, you know, you're looking at other people in the yeah. session. Uh, we, we have talked about this maybe before once uh, in a different context. So then you're not looking at the camera lens. Uh, it looks like you're looking away from the camera and trying to look at the broader zoom screen, right. which causes a little bit of a disconnect. Ari, is that, uh, is that a fair way to describe your question? Yes, that's right. And how to resolve that. Okay, think about television and having a studio audience. And in the middle of that studio audience is a teleprompter that you never, ever see. And Ryan Seacrest is up there on stage just whipping out words like he knows what the hell he's talking about. And all he's doing is reading a teleprompter, looking straight into that camera like I'm looking at you right now. And then he'll look over at the audience and say, hey, Misto, Oh, I love your beard, man. That is a cool beard. And then he'll come back to the camera and say, yeah, everybody, everybody take a look at Misto right now. And he, you just have to learn how to use the camera. And if you're the presenter, it's most important for you if you're the presenter. If you're not the presenter, look anywhere you want to look. But as the presenter, it's your responsibility to make eye contact with your audience. The only way to make eye contact with your audience in this virtual freaking world right now is looking into the camera. Now, I have seen one software that's coming, I, I forget the name, that's, that's got some eye tracking software built in and it's gonna be able to make it look like you're looking into the camera no matter where you look and I can't wait to see how that looks, but I'm not too, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not too hopeful. It's, it's, it's kind of like you gotta get your head wrapped around the fact that you're in, you're in television land and your studio audience is on the, are on the screen. Yeah. So Nathan, one, one quick point. I, I, we have two other questions, but uh, one quick point on that. I think we tend to um, want to look at, see right now, if I look at you, I'm not yeah. looking at my camera. Right. Because it's, it's right next to it. So right. the peripheral vision, you don't have to actually look at maybe the audience in, in, in the Zoom setting, but you can quote unquote looks still at them using your peripheral vision while you look at the camera. Is that a fair way to put it? Exactly, especially if you take the camera and put the camera sort of in the middle of the screen. Mine is in the middle of two screens because I, that's how I think. I've got my slides over here, I've got you on my left. So if I need to quickly look over and see, are you shaking your head? Yes, if I need to see your background, I can see you have a bridge in your background, but I do kind of need to go quickly like, okay, you have a bridge in your background but then I forget you're over there. And yes, I do miss your facial expressions. But when you're in a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two or one-on-three, it's mm -hmm. one-on-four even, it's kind of easier because you just, you put everybody's heads behind the camera, yeah. All right? You just make it small enough, stick everybody behind your camera on the screen. That's, if you're doing one-on-ones, it's easy. I just, like Becky, you just happen to be lucky. You're in the top right corner of my screen right now. Does it look like I'm looking directly at you right now? And, and, and I'm, I'm looking into my camera. Now I'm looking directly at you. Does it still look like I'm looking in the camera? A little bit, maybe, not as much, but I can glance over at her. I can see she's trying to talk and I can say, hey, you're on mute. Whereas if I have to come over to Zoomy, I have to come over here because she's way on the left. So when you put people like that, you know, when you're in one, one, one to two, it's easier. In the one to many, it gets very complex. Maybe to summarize, put uh, the camera in the middle of your screen, so you have the ability to change your focus, what you're focusing on, I see. 
Yeah. Makes and then sense. your eyes don't move too much. You're not moving yeah. all over the place. Only yeah. if you're the presenter, especially if you're the presenter. Okay. And that's what that articulating arm will do for you. It makes it really easy to put it anywhere you want it to go. Or try. I'm, looking at, I'm keeping an eye on the time. Um, I'll go okay. to uh, maybe one or two more questions quickly. Do you have tips on how to remember your talk without overly depending on your notes? Oh, yes. Two things. Record the audio of you doing your presentation just to your smartphone audio, just audio, as if you were on the radio, like really act it out just like you would if you were on the radio or if you were on stage. And then listen to it as often as you can. If you don't like the way it sounds, just re-record it. And then just use that as the model. The other is, uh, I just lost my train of thought. What was your question again? It was, uh, how, how do you do, do your talk without having oh. necessarily notes? Wait, yeah. that's what, thank you. That's what they call a senior moment. Okay. <laughs> So the other, my favorite, most effective tool that I use myself that I've been using since 1988 and that I use with all my clients are mind maps. Ah. Draw yourself a mind map of the talk. Just Google mind maps. You'll see what they look like. You just need a piece of paper and a pencil and then stick that mind map behind the camera. <laughs> awesome. Just quickly, one more question because we are, we are running out of time. Um, Kiran, Kiran says, you made it look so simple. What kind of prep went into today's meeting? Oh, 35 years of presenting, <laughs> uh, 13 years of being a coach, but to be uh, straight up with you, I put in seven to 10 hours on this presentation rehearsing out loud. I don't normally rehearse out loud because I know my topic so well. I just look at the clock and they say, oh, you have 30 minutes and I just pick enough topics and then I pick enough stories. I either add more detail to the stories or I pull detail out of the stories. Like I could have taken this 40 minute talk. I could have made it an hour and a half and just used exactly the same slides, but with a short break. I would have just yeah. told more stories, given more examples. I think we'll wrap up here. I'll hand it back Thank to you. Gavin because we do need to get to a couple things. Um, again, Nathan, this I was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. I hope it was useful. Oh. I enjoyed it very much. I hope it was useful to everyone. And um, let me at this point uh, hand it back to Gavin Wong. Gavin. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the really impressive presentation. And thank you, Satish, for the conduction of the whole meeting. Actually, I was crying during what? when listening to the presentation. Why? Because when Nathan was sharing the different tips, it's just like a movie for me oh. to just call, recall my experiences. I, I just wondering if I have learned this, these lessons 10 years ago, even five years ago, I may make much, much more achievements in, in my life. Uh, actually, I do have one, uh, two questions for Nathan. Okay. Okay. The, the first one is, I believe you're a master in capturing people's attention, especially to me. Uh, do you think there is a, a unit for human beings attention span? If there is, how long it is, for instance, seven seconds or 12 seconds, and how, how have you done for it to have the greatest, the perfect reason to control uh, the listener's attention? I, let me see if I understand what you, you, let me see if I can answer it politely. There's research out there about attention spans and all this that you're mentioning. And I take that kind of stuff with a grain of salt because it all depends on you as a presenter, what your topic is. And more importantly, the bottom line to me is how effective are we as a speaker at transferring our enthusiasm, passion, love, whatever you want to call what's in your heart 
to your audience, you can do that for 40 minutes straight nonstop without letting go of your audiences and the seven second rule doesn't apply. I mean, did the seven second rule or the seven minute rule or whatever the rule is apply here in these 40 minutes that we had just now? It's all in how you, how Nathan, transferred his love, his enthusiasm, and his passion for this freaking topic called communications to every one of you. And you know, the best part of my, my being with you here today is I can't bullshit any of you, right? You are all professionals. You are all trained in techniques, in tools, in ways of captivating your audience's attention. So when you ask me, do I believe or what do you think about those things? I think that they probably apply in some way. But when you carve out that brand of from the minute you start speaking, you never let your audience go until you're done. Those rules don't apply. Okay, thank Keep you, being Nathan. authentic and honest, especially when you're authentic and honest. Okay, thank you. The second question I have for you is, you know, people have a different point based on their names, their, their perspectives. And this is kind of the root for many, many conflicts. And it's happening every day. And some of them are really stubborn. So when facing, confront, confronting with such kind of stubborn attitude or point, oh, can you share one lesson with us to deal with such a situation? I'll share two. The first lesson is go study how to handle objections. Satish probably has a bookshelf filled with books on how to deal with objections. The other is... <laughs> The, the secret that I use all of the time when somebody is being a little confrontational with me. And look, I talk about a topic like this and I run in, you know, all the time. So when I run into people that are experts at presentations or they've done seven TED talks and they walk up to me and, you know, they try to be a little confrontational, I turn on the love. I just turn it on. I let them talk. I ask them questions. I let them pontificate. They just want love. You know, we all have, if, if, you're, if you're comfortable in your own skin, I would just get them talking. My secret in dispelling or dis, what's the word? Dispersing a confrontational is I'll say, you know, tell me more about that. I'm, I'm really curious. No, I really want to understand what you mean by that and get them talking more and more and more. Eventually they run out of words. Sometimes that happens in, in a real room with 20, 50, or 100 people. Somebody becomes a little confrontational. I'll just let them talk. Tell me more about that. Eventually, they will run out and they'll calm down. People just like to be heard sometimes. So it's all about objections. You're asking for me to answer with one answer, and that's a very complicated question. Normally, if somebody's confrontational, I'll just ask them, what's going on? What, what's, what's going on here? But I don't often run into confrontational situations. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. The following up question is, you are, uh, you are talking about asking questions. Mm. So sometimes we are in a really tough situation and okay. how to, do you have approach to guide us to ask the right, the befitting question in a really tough question, uh, in a really tough situation? how to ask the right question. With as much love and kindness and empathy in your voice that you can. Voice. It's all in the voice. It's all in the voice. It's all in your tone of voice. Your tone of voice could be causing the confrontation to exacerbate. And if all you did was perhaps change your tone of voice a little bit, it would, it would potentially make that confrontational situation better. For example, when you ask somebody why, that can be a confrontational why. You say, well, I'm not feeling good today. Why? I'm not feeling good today. Why? Why is that? You know, you, there, it's all in your voice, folks. You know that. 
when somebody's being confrontational to you, you need to figure out what the best way is to, to calm them down if that's what you need to do. If they need to yell it out for a little bit, you just egg them on until they're all done. And when they run out of steam, then they're, they're, they're fine. Sounds like you're getting into quite a bit of uh, persuasion and sales. I'd get, I'd get Caldini's book on influence and there are things in there that you can use as well. Okay, thank you. Another question is, uh, I was partially crying during the whole presentation. There's a reason. The reason is I have noticed that you are extremely present. And I think you're very lucky because you're passionate about what you are doing. Mm -hmm. And how, how to be extremely present? Do you have a kind of panacea way for us to to be a present yes it takes practice you can't just turn it on if you don't know what it feels like to be present so if you're even questioning the pre the fact of am i present or not means you're probably not yet all present so putting yourself in situations where you can practice the art of communication is how you learn to be more present, especially with these cameras that we're all faced with today. The more you do it, the more you record yourself, the more you watch yourself, it's like any other skill that you're learning in Toastmasters or in a sport, you definitely need to practice this stuff and be open to learning more, be open to failing, you know, be open to somebody saying, Nathan, it just, you don't seem right today. And you say, well, you know what? You're right. I'm, I'm not myself today. For some reason, I just feel off. Not that I did today. The other thing, Gavin, I appreciate that question because we all experience imposter syndrome where we don't quite really believe our own BS, but we hope other people do until we can get paid enough. And then once enough people pay us, then we can, oh, kind of. Okay, I guess uh, the value I'm providing is there. I went through that for about two years at the beginning of my consulting practice that I'm still in now, 13 years later. And the way I handled that, the way I got to my core and the way I got to my clients was I dropped my fee to zero, but I told them my fee per hour is X dollars per hour but I'm new at this. I'm still working on this. So your fee is zero, but I need to be able to tell the story of us working together to my future clients. And I need you to be able to answer a phone call occasionally if I need you. Are you willing? But just to do it for free is total BS, folks. Don't give your stuff away. And now at least they know there's some value there. Now you prove your value to the point where you say, okay, got a new client's calling up today. I'm going to charge them some money see what they do. And then you offer a 100% money back guarantee. There are very few consultants like me on the planet that will say as part of your opening three sentences, this is what I do. This is how I do it. This is how I charge. And oh, by the way, at any point in our engagement, if you are not totally 100% happy with what you're getting from me, you will either get back all the money you have spent already, or you will not get an invoice. And I can tell you that 90% of my business gets closed because I use that line. And in 13 years, I've never had to give the money back. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. And the last question here is about uh, storytelling. Uh, this is especially important for Toastmasters because Toastmasters, the lessons from Toastmasters heavily stressed on this point. But sometimes, personally, I notice that a story sometimes gives me a feeling of phony information. So the question here is how to leverage stories or should we use stories or how to use it? It depends on the goal of your communication. If you are trying to persuade someone, 
stories generally engage us, right? Because the brain's wired for stories. So it's the number one tool on the planet to engage an audience is just start telling a story. That's why so many of the TED speakers captivate our attention right away because they stand up and they look around the audience and they say, 17 years ago when I was growing up and boom, we're all attached to the story because it's a story and that's just how the brain works. But you need to ask yourself, what's the goal of the communication? In my world, a lot of the goal of the communication is to get another meeting. So I'll use that as an example. You got a half an hour, you talk on blah, 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 blah. If you get the meeting for the, if you know you have the next meeting at 18 minutes into the hour, you end the call. Say, hey, listen, I think we have our marching orders for the next meeting. I'll give you back a few minutes. Thank you so much for your time and you hang up. Why? Because you could sell yourself right out of whatever you just sold yourself into or sell them out of, unpersuade them of whatever you just persuaded them for. So typically we're trying to persuade people to give us more time. So once you have more time, you've reached your goal. What part of the story do you have to tell in order to get more time? What part of how much story do you need to tell to get somebody to say yes or no, or let me think about that. So if you look at Disney, for example, there's what, seven basic storylines that you can create movies around or whatever that number is. And people go study those really hard. And then they say, hmm, I'm going to tell a story at a keynote. Let me pick the hero's journey. Okay, the hero's journey. And then you use a proven story method that Disney has proven with so many of their movies. And you go up there and you substitute your bits and pieces into that story. And it should work if you do it with your, the right voice and the right gestures and everything else that goes with a, a great presentation. But you might not need all of that, that to get somebody to say yes. You might be in an elevator with somebody and you're about to get off when we get back in elevators and they're going right and you're going left. And you say, excuse me, just a minute, Satish, I noticed that you, you work at Blue Prism. Do you mind if I just ask you a question? And he says, no, right. Over. I only have a few seconds because my Uber car is waiting. And I say to him, you know, if I could show you a way that you could triple the number of meetings that your salespeople could get as a second meeting, would you want to know more about that? And I hope he might say, well, sure, here's my card. I'll follow up. Done. I mean, do I have to tell any story there to get them to say yes or no? No, probably not. Use stories where they're appropriate and you don't always have to start at the beginning and ending, but you know, end, end your story. If you have to start in the middle, you start in the middle. That's kind of the joy of storytelling is there's no rules, really. I mean, you may think there are some rules and there might be for a hero's journey kind of a story. I mean, the, the hero has to have a journey or it's not a story, obviously. I'm sorry, I'm ranting a little bit. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you for all the sharing. <laughs> I really, really appreciate the tools you have presented, the solid knowledge, the skills you have conveyed. Obviously, you're the person not just talking or sharing. You are the living example. That's the really impressive part. Thank you. Please help me give a big round of applause to Nathan. Thank you. Thank you. This was the toughest one. I'll tell you, you know, you're right. You ha if you're going to teach other people how to present or teach other people how to be better communicators, you better be a freaking good communicator yourself and live everything you're telling people. Because if you don't, you're not being an example of what they can be. And I'm not just doing it to be an example to you. This is who I am. This is the, the brand I've created. This is how I've turned myself into a fairly effective communicator. By reading all those books, by trying all sorts of things, by failing miserably, by insulting people accidentally on stage, and then the whole audience goes from being in the palm of my hand to like, what, did you really just say that? And I, oh, like 500 people went from being my friends to my enemies, like in 10 seconds. And I, it took me about four minutes to get them back. And I was like the worst situation ever. But thank you so much. Listen, feel free to link in with me. I'm, I'm happy to stay in touch, share networks. And if you ever want me to come back, I'm happy to come back. Thank you. So oh, much. sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a new role, role, role model in my life. Thank you. <laughs> now thank you. I want to share my screen for the video for the next workshop. Can you hear it? No. 
No, no sound. No, no, no sound. sound. That's a video. No sound. Okay. So who can help me out? Yeah, when you, you need to, your... when you but... shared your screen, there was a check mark you had to you had to check that audio should play. If you have the latest version of Zoom, what oh, okay, you can I got it, got it. Okay, thank you, thank you for the help. Hi, this is Shubha Rao, the club mentor chair from District One Hundred One. If you are already a mentor and you want to learn how to enhance your skills further. We have a great event planned for you. It is on November 17th at 6 p.m. Please join us. I will be discussing with a panel of mentors on how mentoring a new club can actually benefit you. Hope to see you all there on November 17th at 6 p.m. Okay, this is the workshop coming under the great event. And you can get more information from district uh, d101tm.org. You can uh, register for the session. So any other questions? Bob, uh, I believe you have a lot of insights. Uh, do you have any comments or any questions? Not this time, no questions, but uh, just thank Nathan for sharing some great information. Uh, as you said it in the beginning, it necessarily wasn't all new, but there were a few interesting angles that you presented the materials in, which gave me some great ideas. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Which one sticks out most for you, Bob? I'm just curious. Uh, let's see, go back to my notes here. Um, I, I, I like the, um, um, where is it here? Sorry. That's okay. I just close that window. So. Um, just I'm the, always curious because I, I get so many tools out. I'm always curious what sticks out. Yeah, the, the emotional appeals, right? So just ah. list of the four emotional appeals. I mean, you're right. That's something sometimes we do it inherently or just intuitively. But to have it uh, specified out in a framework like that kind of puts some things in perspective for me. So I appreciate that. Here's the book. I still have it. It's falling apart. I just can't. I, I just can't let it go. I still have it. It's like a treasure. <laughs> That's awesome. I also mentioned in the comments too. You know, you mentioned Dale Carnegie's book, and my father gave me the book when I was young too. So I totally relate to what it you probably were looks like this, right? <laughs> no, it's an old, old copy. It's the old black and yellow one. I think it was like the first or second edition. Yeah. Okay. Just make sure everybody knows, especially the women that are on the line and watching, do not buy the original book. Make sure you get the one that's been updated for the digital age because <laughs> it's, it's really sense. insulting. <laughs> <laughs> Men, cigars, get me a cigarette, you know. Kind of <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. So, Cynthia, right. do you have any comment? No, just really enjoyed all the information that you provided and especially was helpful because we are on Zoom right now. So, the, the, the difference in the way we have to present is, is definitely something to, uh, that is a learning process for many of us. Yes, it well, is. I've written down and done screenshots of everything that you provided. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. My pleasure. My pleasure. Okay, awesome. So, Harry, do you have any comment? Uh, no, no. Uh, I just did, totally enjoy it. I, I didn't read any of this book before, so this is all new to me. Thank you very oh, much. Good. Oh, excellent. Yeah, that's the thing is, you know, when I point some of that stuff out, that, you know, this Dale Carnegie book was written in October of 1936. Uh, human nature hasn't changed that much. I think this uh, Roy Garn book was written in the in the 50s. So, you know, again, human nature hasn't changed. So you just get to leverage it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Miss though, any comments? Yes, Mr. You're muted. Okay, we may get back to you later. So, Candy, uh, is there a place that you, you feel really helpful or uh, do you have any comments? Um, 
I do. Uh, thanks yes. for coming out. <laughs> I do have a question for Nathan. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, definitely the tools that you presented, 10 tools. And I have a quick question. I do work in sales, inside sales. And, uh, or I lost that job actually two weeks ago, but I'm looking for the next role very similar to it. And much of that job is trying to capture someone's attention in, like we say, the first 30 seconds or seven seconds, whatever that window is. <clears throat> Just wanted to know if uh, those 10 tools in theory, could they work in condensing all of those into that, that short time frame that you have to capture the person's intention and, um, you know, so that they don't uh, say no, thank you and hang up. In theory, would all those 10 work as well in the same way rather than over a long presentation? Absolutely. I mean, you, you can't get them all in in 30 seconds, but starting with the beginning of the time First of all, let me back up and say, you know, it depends if it's a cold call or a warm call, right? If it's oh, cold, both. Call, yeah. <laughs> cold calls have to go maybe a little bit differently because people don't really like telemarketers in the first yeah. place yeah. or anybody calling and saying, hey, do you have five minutes? I could sell you something, which is uh, so if it's a warm introduction, I would handle it differently. But in general, yes, the time is always the most important thing, which is the first thing in the six signals. And then all those other tools that we talked about, the emotional appeal, the recognition, the money. I would go think about how could you come up with a question or two or an opening line or two using one or more of those fatal four emotional appeals to get that person listening or an email that you write to them to mm -hmm. say, yes, I'll meet with you for five minutes or 10 minutes. I would do that. Um, okay, great. <laughs> Sounds like I've uh, been along the right lines then. Yeah. Just oh, yeah. Tailor it a little bit more. Good luck finding a new job. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Anitha, uh, I've noticed that you're here. Any comments or, yeah, any suggestions? Yeah, Nathan, I really enjoyed the talk. There's so many helpful things. There are some books that I've already read, but there are some that was really good that I wanted to check back, especially the one on bragging without tooting your horn. Uh, for me, the biggest challenge I've had is to be able to present myself as here is me without feeling very shy or not, even though I have my list of accomplishments, it's just not being able to say that because I feel like that's a wrong thing to do, especially coming from the culture I'm from. So I would like you to suggest some ways we could do that as part of your speech without uh, without actually feeling that shyness or without yeah. feeling that I'm not being humble, you know? Yeah. The answer comes from going through two or three of the questions in the take 12 from Peggy Klaus, believe okay. it or not. You okay. can just look at, you don't have to buy the book, just go online, go to that page on my site. You just, as soon as you get some of that stuff out of your head and off of that resume or a CV, and you set aside some of your cultural differences in how you talk about yourself. Biggest example there is when you have a PhD in Norway, nobody really cares in Norway because everybody gets a PhD. That's how they, they go to school. It's all free pretty much all the way through PhD. They just go all the way like career students. But when a Norwegian comes to Silicon Valley and stands up and says, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, when I finished my PhD 10 years ago, we found blah, 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 blah. I love that. I could say when I finished PhD 15 years ago. <laughs> That's the humble brag, my, my friend. That's it. It's not a long blah, 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 blah. I did it. It's like none of those sentences really need to start with I. It's a story. Good morning. Back 15 years ago, I can remember standing in front of my PI, defending my PhD. And the thing that I remember most here 15 years later is boom. And now you have all of our freaking attention. You're telling a story and you established your credibility with a humble brag. How about wow. that? See, now you don't have to go buy the book. You just did it. <laughs> The, the funny oh, thing about through this for sure. <laughs> oh, you're gonna Thank say you. Satish? No, I was gonna say Anita is uh, part of the club that I'm part of. Oh, and um, what is interesting is um, 
there's so much about so many achievements that Adita has. Ah. For about um, eight or nine months after I joined the club, I had no idea that she had she had so many accomplishments behind her. So I think if anybody can, can I mean, Anita, if, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to say this. You, you need to do this more, right? The ability to brag without sounding because you have so much to, so yeah. much you have achieved and so much to offer. So, And you may need two or three different humble brags based on the audience, the situation. Uh, to be perfectly upfront with you, when I was up until seven years ago when I coached my first TED presenter, I would say, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So for the past blah, blah, blah years, I've worked with over 10,000 of this and 4,000 of that and blah, 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 blah. Oh, God, the guy got big numbers. He must know what he's doing. Then when I got my first TED speaker, and I have an amazing story to tell about it, and I start, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. After 10 years of coaching, blah, blah, and TED speaker, blah, blah. I now I just say I coach TED speakers, and that's enough to most people because they know what it takes to be a TED speaker. That's so crazy. I drop all that other stuff out because it's not needed. So I have like three or four I use. Okay. This is great because I'm going to be watching for all these humble brags and every talk then, see how people are using it. There you go. <laughs> you were right here. There you go. You got it. You can figure out when you watch your TED and TEDx talks, pick apart their opening. What emotional appeals are they using? How did they get your attention? How did they keep your attention? Was it in their voice? Was it in the way they, there's so much to be learned by knowing kind of the mechanics or the science a little bit, you know, it is art too, because none of us are, I can't give you, I can't make you into me. Somebody says to me, Nathan, how do I present as good as you? Well, you, I don't know. Just go present as good as you. Become you. You don't want to become me. Yeah, you could do some of the things I'm doing, but if you try to do some of the things I'm doing as a Norwegian, they would look really weird because they don't do as much enthusiasm as a Nathan. It's very much outside of their culture and they wouldn't be able to. So I'm not about that. I'm about helping people like you and you and you and you and you find your voices so that you can build whatever brand of a person you want to be known as. And that takes your entire lifetime. All the things that have happened in your life. Yes, Bob, anything to add? I would just add one quick comment to that is some people are not so successful in being humble in their bragging. I and know. Don't name any particular politicians, but I think we have seen some people who go overboard. So oh. it's a fine line you have to dance sometimes. You bet. You bet it is. And it's all dependent on how much trust and credibility do you need to build at that moment. The PhD is, an, is a very, very effective credibility establisher. Okay, thank you all. Any other thank questions? You, you yes, welcome. Anita? No, I just said thanks Thanks to all three of them. This was very helpful. Thanks, Nathan. Satish. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thanks for hanging in, everybody. That's kind of nice. But yeah, other things you want to do on a Saturday. I'm good. I'm I'm not going anywhere. Okay, the last uh, opportunity we just give to Satish because he is the Toastmaster of the day. So any question, comments for Nathan? I'll just say uh, it every time I speak to Nathan. I was telling him this uh, when we were doing some tech checks this morning. I've known Nathan for a few years now, and. Every time I speak to him, I pick something up. I don't know what it is about him. And he, I don't think he, he told me as much that he's not doing this intentionally, but mm. there's something he'll say and I'll say, oh, I'm learning. Oh, I learned something new today, right? So I'll just say that every time it's been a learning and growing experience for me in this friendship. So thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you very much. I'm always looking for new things to add to my, my shtick, as they say. What, what uh, Satish is referring to is uh, we were going to put a PDF file together with all my slides and my slides use very high resolution photos. So when I make a PDF, it's like 150 megabytes, which is too hard to send around. So I use small PDF utility online and it shrinks it down to like 10 megabytes. And Satish says, oh, I didn't know about that. That's pretty cool. Small PDF. There's so many tools like that on the road. I remember, I'm cheap. I'm a company of one. I got to find all these tools to make my life easy. <laughs> 
All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, everybody. Thank you. I could talk about thank this you. stuff all day, but I know you all want to get to the rest of your day. Happy to come back. Happy to stay yeah. in touch. Thank you very much. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you very much, Nathan. Thank you, yeah. Satish. Yeah, I know. Cheers. Bye. Bye.